Did you guys like play Reed Lightweight? I've heard two. Yep. You're still? That's a good picture. What is that? Mas quando eu tenho que lá, eu vou sair. We're speaking to the lonely girl in Turin. <laughs> A Torino. Ragazzi solitari che lavorate mentre tutti sono fuori a fumare. Oh. <laughs> Sapete che siamo solidali con voi. <laughs> Avete tutta la nostra solidarietà. Speriamo che si prendano il raffreddore con gli altri. Vi lasciamo il vostro lavoro. Aspetta che non ti sento, aspetta, aspetta, aspetta. Ok, adesso puoi parlare. Credo. No. No, non ci sentiamo comunque. Uh. <ride> Grazie, inizia a essere fastidioso. Il mondo di YouTube ti odia, chiunque tu sia. <ride> ecco, giusto perché... <ride> He's copying me. That's me.
Bene, bene, bene. C'è umorismo alle tre e mezzo del mattino a Torino. Ottimo. I don't think they even look at <laughs>
I think we have an highlight for the workshop. <laughs> Sorry, Turkey, we apologize. Istanbul. We are deeply sorry. <laughs> we just wanted to check the reactions. It's like psychological test.
Okay, guys, we're getting ready to start here. So we got pretty much everything, but we're missing uh, Delft stuff. Did you upload something, Delft? <laughs> Matthijs, somebody in Delft can please answer. Sorry, I can. Uh, I can't read Dutch, actually. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay, it's uh, uploading now. Okay, okay. So. Maybe we can start from uh, Turin. Would that be okay with you guys in Turin? And then in the meanwhile, uh, please upload everything and we'll try to get it ready over here. Ah, okay. Me, me, what about Istanbul? Can we start from Istanbul? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, very good. Um, Theo, um, yeah. Okay, so we go Istanbul, Penn State, Turin, and Delft. I think we are pretty much set. We can go, the order is uh, Istanbul, Penn State, Turin, Delft, and us, or if you want to put us in the between, it's no problem. Okay, five, let's say five. So it's going to be something like a five minute presentation. Yeah, three to five minutes, they tell me. Uh, just, I mean, keep it uh, clean and simple. Uh, I guess we can start from Istanbul. Let's the, let just. Yeah, yeah, no, we can hear them. Okay. So shall I start? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. You can start. Uh, we can look to the first team, team one. Uh, they are the ones working on the uh, highways, and they are the ones who are working with a game, board game. So right now, they're uh, what you see is like their uh, characters they created. There is constructor, uh, chamber of architects, president, and citizen one citizen two so and mayor so they created these characters and uh, they are basically building on that so everyone has different powers uh, and different ways of building constructing the city and they have uh, building a house uh, building Tokyo and uh, demolish this and build forest demolish bridge build bridge and lucky card so this is how it's going and you see then on third and fourth JPEG, uh, how they're uh, making the game. So it's mostly a turn-based game um, based on Istanbul. They change, like they create those um, hexagon-shaped um, areas that each of those um, users will affect, um, the, each of those characters. And so it's going to be a, um, a turn-based um, game that different powers will play over the Istanbul. Um, so let's talk about like that, the first team. Okay. okay. The second okay. team is... Uh, so the second team is Waterfront. And... Uh, biodiversity, which they probably said now. So they're working on some kind of satirical uh, story. So their idea is uh, because uh, Istanbul has these waters and uh, we were uh, earlier talking about how this building of the bridges will actually uh, destroy the water reserves and stuff like that. So uh, their idea came from that. So they're saying all this uh, building madness, this Faustian way of building, uh, is actually caused by this uh, antique uh, water, uh, which is found, it's like one uh, spring found in Istanbul. So all these mayors and our prime minister and these people who actually drank it are the ones who are building this crazy project so uh, they make something like 
uh, you know, onion uh, Can you show us, sorry, can you show us the images through the webcam so that we know what your, if you have like the papers in front of you? Okay. Okay. No, we, are, we are all looking from the... Uh, Actually, I can show you this. Um, yes. Okay. This. Thanks. That image. Okay. Uh, if, like you can see from also the Dropbox review to Team 2. Yes. Um, yeah, it's okay. So yeah. they have like an antique like amphoras like found and it's this water and this is the story and then they uh, made like the mayor and prime minister they mm -hmm. actually all drank this water and then they have these uh, articles like onion uh, newspaper articles so this is uh, how uh, the traffic in the Bosphorus and they already built the canal so it's full of tankers and uh, there, is, there are no forests anymore in Istanbul it's all built area built environment so uh, and then how the biodiversity is affected because there are no more like uh, fishes and other kind of living organisms uh, present in Bosphorus after the bridge is built so uh, this is how their story is going yeah. And the chain tree is working on this. Okay. Uh, so they're also changing the map of Istanbul. Uh, they're adding like the canale and uh, stuff, and then they're looking uh, what happens to the built environment. Uh, there is the second image. Second image. Mm -hmm. And the second Im image is uh, uh, like a physical model, um, which they are like creating a, um, which they are like redoing all these um, physics. Existing, existing urban structures, and um, they are uh, like trying to layer them up in a different way. So they will see how uh, those new uh, like canal and other like bridge and everything will affect the exi existing parts of Istanbul. So it's also like showing that image, that physical model. But um, we can't upload it now. So it's uploaded actually. So, so, so you will see from the team tree. Um, in Dropbox folder. Yeah. Yes, it's yeah, yeah, we got the we got a couple of images right now. Mm -hmm. Probably we're missing this third one that you're talking about. Well, yeah, I think there's a problem. We also have difficulties in accessing we that. Can't I will check that in in like five ten minutes. Okay, no problem, no problem. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, basic outline. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, so. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, can we see <laughs> what Penn State is about uh, is working on? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So basically we're imagining uh, this future. Actually, let me let me back up. We um the text. Sorry. Sorry, one second. No okay. problem. So basically, we've been looking at these boom and bust cycles that have basically been the story of Pennsylvania since its inception, um, and we're looking at this current fracking boom. Um, as like to avoid the bus cycle, uh, in instead pictured as a catalyst um, for a more stable future. Um, we're looking at things like so. There's these su the supply lines um, of how gas is currently transported um, across the United States, and uh, we're we're pushing for development along uh, along these corridors that in that uh. We're pushing for development along these corridors of uh, utilities. Um, 
and the idea, the idea is like rather than let this money escape like uh, we've been kind of through history just selling off our assets um, and this money comes into the system very briefly uh, but then just sort of leaks out so what we're, we're looking at is like we're envisioning this future where uh, where Pennsylvanians uh, take community ownership of their resources and when they're extracted um, it becomes reinvested in the land in which they live. So in a sense we're taking um, the value out of a layer that's underground and we're transporting it onto this layer where humans actually live. Um, and like through this, these sort of actions like establishing uh, like kind of shattering political boundaries and establishing um, ecological identities and ecological boundaries that um, are guiding development and uh, promoting the idea of an ecological identity. Concentrating yeah, okay. concentrating development along corridors. Uh, where's the, yeah. Um, sort of a linear cities where we, we concentrate um, you know, along these utility corridors and then uh, can maximize natural areas outside of them. Um, which allows for uh, large contiguous patches of wilderness which is designed and controlled by the people who use the resources. Okay. I'm very I tired. <laughs> Yeah, we kind of yeah, all kind are. Of all. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Martin, can we go with Beijing? Yeah. Okay. I have to look at the screen, otherwise I don't know what will come up. Yeah? Okay. Yeah? One, two, three. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Can we do the demo view up? The demo view. Yeah. And not this one with the cover page. No, no, no. Show the. Oh yeah. No. Doesn't work. I mean, let's, let's go like this. Okay, fine. But then don't show the cover page. View. Go to view. Go to view. Place display. Show cover page. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, here we are. That doesn't work, I think. Go next. No. Okay. Yeah, let's leave it like that. Yeah, thank you. Go next. Okay, first of all, um, Beijing as a city is a very, what's very interesting about Beijing as a city is that most of the city is, is concentrated on the, on, in this page on the east where we have all the black is city and all the white on the left is um, a natural area which we represent mountains or, or plains. And we can see that the, the city of Beijing kind of stretches into the, into the landscape, uh, like it stretches into the valleys of the mountain. Um, go next. If we reverse that one, we can uh, we can maybe more clearly see that where the white part is is urbanized area, where the black part is is a non-urbanized area, and our focus site is located in the fringes of these two, like the edges where the city still pierces into the mountains and the mountains become more wild. 
this is the condition uh, where we like to uh, like this contrast Mr. Chefe also showed in the morning um, between Beijing as a city and Trendisha as a village inside the nature. Go on, yeah. um, this is a very uh, difficult to see on the Beamer picture that shows the location of this um, small village, Twendisha, in the middle of the, the mountains. Um, this village is located um, on the axis of the... actually if we go to the right on one pink hole, we enter Beijing. If we, go f if we follow the route to the left, all the way to the, to the left top, we go to uh, Shanxi, which is another province, and our site, Twendisha, is an old uh, town that used to be a trading post, the last trading post before entering Beijing for the people coming from Shanxi province. Uh, like I said, this uh, actually this site is located in the middle of nowhere and it's a very small site. Inside the red square we see a white dot as to indicate the size of the village. In the neighboring hills there are a couple of villages uh, which are quite more significantly uh, in terms of size, but uh, the village we identify with, Twendisha, is unique before its, uh, for its historic history. Uh, his for history. Good. It has a, a very interesting combination of uh, traditional uh, well-preserved courtyard houses and an abundance of uh, natural areas. And if you look at the development of this uh, village, it was established in the Ming Dynasty by the Han family coming from Shanxi to control the trade route of uh, coals and other supplies going to Beijing. It had a rapid decline because of the, um, uh, the installation of a railroad in the early 20th century and then kind of uh, spurred back to life again at the end of the 20th century because there was a movie filmed which made the, the city, uh, the village very famous and it became a top tourist attraction. Actually um, it is more popular than certain UNESCO World Heritage Sites in Beijing. For instance, there are more pictures, twice as many pictures of this village as for the Ming tombs found on Google. Um, here will be some information about the, uh, uh, the build-up of the city, where the traditional courtyard houses have a certain hierarchy in terms of space and um, environmental conditions that makes them well suited for the site. Uh, what we envision in this area and how to deal with, um, with the uh, beyond the city theme is that we actually identify uh, a loop of, of small cities uh, around this kind of a central area. If we go next. Um, and how to deal with this... Um, can you see it? Yeah. Oh. And how to, well, anyway, I'm talking to a white screen. And how to deal with these cluster of cities? What kind of approach can we have? Can we connect them, combine them, loop them, integrate them? And then we go next. And what we decide is that actually these village around, they have a, there's a road uh, connecting them. That road you can enter from the, from the bottom right, and you can exit to the top left. And we, we take this uh, idea of the loop, because, also next, um, the loop, also cannot see, Actually, actually, the loop uh, encloses a, 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 a group of hills, and inside that hills we have identified uh, another valley. So we can create two systems. One system which benefits the masses, the tourists that go visit this spot because it's famous, because it's cheap, because it's easy to get to. And on the, on the other hand, a very secluded, more landscape approach. Go next. Where actually these are pictures of the inside of this valley inside, um, close to this village, which is totally untouched yet, and where we could maybe uh, identify a certain uh, Shangri-La, uh, a kind of uh, getaway escape for, um, for people that want to um, escape from the city, and also escape from the crowds. In Beijing, the most precious you can get is fresh air and no people. That's it. So that's it from Beijing. Um, next, can we ask Turin to introduce what they have? Can you hear us, Turin? Yeah, here we are. So uh, okay, now our uh, groups are working on the A1 conceptual image, and so we can show you some drafts of their work. This, you, 
this one is the group working about the landscape team. Uh, they are focusing on a channel and they will have some dense spots along the channel and their concept is also related to the water flow, uh, the water speed and their goal is to create a water axis with some activities on it. Then they are working also with some sections. This is the group focusing on economy. Uh, their concept is the empty space. So they imagine like people moving from the middle territories to the two poles, Milan and Torino. And the empty space will provide leisures and product to the city. Uh, so their concept is a very strong city against a very strong empty natural world. While the group uh, working on society, their concept is the diversity. So they have mm, many places with many potentials in the space between Torino and Milano. Uh, this diversity will be opposed to the cities which are becoming monotonous, all the same all around the world. Um, all, the, all these interesting places in the Middle Territories will be connected and will create a strong entity as strong as a city. So that's it. Okay, I mean, sounds as we ask clean and simple, that's great. Thank you, Torino. Uh, next one, Delft. <laughs> yep, we're here. Uh, okay. Thank you. Oops. <laughs> Moet ik hier moet ik doorklikken. All right. Make it see me. Ik heb iets. Het is gewoon een linker naar rechter muis nog niet gemaakt. Dan is rechter muis op de volgende. Um, the presentation is in our Dropbox folder under concept, so you can. Uh, have that also. Um, can everyone hear us? Me? Yes. OK, good. So um, we sort of uh, came to something we could all agree upon, is that the Randstad is actually a sort of uh, intellectual construct. So it's not actually there, but certain people or certain stakeholders perceive it as such. Um, so that, that was our sort of basic uh, premise. Um, so for everything, everything's, everyone thinks, this is things, <laughs> it's something else, uh, we should change the text. Um, so then we have, you know, if we want to integrate the urban and the rural, uh, we need to know where the borders are uh, in this Randstad and also what points mark the identity uh, behind these borders. So that's both uh, markers that define a sort of urban identity, but also sort of markers that define a sort of a rural identity, uh, and once we know these borders and also the markers within them, uh, only then we can change them uh, and fully integrate uh, the urban and the rural. So, uh, well, just to show you some work, we came up with a sort of matrix of different perceptions of uh, what the Randstad is. So it's um, it's quite schematic, uh, Lee, um, but still a work in progress. But basically, you have um, this first, uh, second, third, sixth, and ninth, and fifth um, option that actually um, are so all, all sort of government proposals uh, over the last couple of decades. 
and this fourth, seventh, and eighth uh, one are uh, ones that are currently not uh, really recognized, but perhaps um, we could use them as different models as opposed to uh, these, these earlier ones. Um, and basically, what we think is happening is that you used to have cities with clear city walls, clear boundaries between the urban and the rural, with a clear marker in the middle of them, so that would be the church that you could see from a distance. And actually, the situation nowadays is that you have boundaries that are not so clear anymore. Sometimes they are, but a lot of the times they aren't. Uh, and the markers within these um, um, areas, they have also changed. So instead of a church, it could be a CBD, or in the rural area, it could be a huge radio tower which defines a certain area. Um, so well, then we try to actually see where are these borders and what do they look like. And as you can see, uh, they're quite different, and sometimes they're really sharp, but other times they're uh, really fluid and going in and out of the city. Um, and we also did some modeling. Um, so you can see um, these cardboard pieces that um, represent hard uh, borders, and then these sort of grayish, grayish pieces that define uh, um, certain soft borders. Uh, and then all the infrastructure that is uh, playing a part in this. Um, and then in this picture, you can see some of the markers we identified. So uh, you have Amsterdam, uh, The Hague, uh, Rotterdam, and Utrecht. And um, they, have a, they have a skyline, and you can see them from afar. So they define as a marker a certain area around them. But also in the countryside, you have windmills defining a certain area, and also the electricity lines defining a certain area. So, uh, well, we're still sort of developing uh, what we can do with this. So, how are we actually going to change these borders now? That that we'll see in our next presentation. Thanks. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much. That sounds really good. All right. Great. Um, so I think uh, now we can start uh, with our presentation in Turin in uh, just one minute. Just the time to uh, our presentation in Beijing. Uh, yep, sure. The time to set everything up and we'll be there. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be in this uh, uh, workshop, uh, which is uh, uh, really a self-organized kind of uh, across the, the entire globe. Uh, um, here I am. Uh, um, my name is uh, Wang Shuo. I'm from the uh, Meta Project. We are a, uh, a kind of uh, not uh, very uh, standard kind of design uh, uh, a firm, we, which we do have kind of design uh, practice and the other half entirely dedicated to uh, uh, urban research and uh, kind of uh, collaboration uh, between international uh, workshops and, and kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> so today actually I, I bring a lecture which I prepared um, a while ago which uh, the title is uh, Urban Contradictions. Uh, it's a bit uh, long, it's a bit longer than, uh, than I prepared so um, we just need to run through all these slides, so let's let's be uh, so everybody expect to see a lot of slides. Okay, um, so I think uh, nowadays uh, I think nobody can sort of escape any discussion uh, with the topic with urban, and the urban, as we understood, the entire world is a archipelago of continents and the archipelago of cities. Um, you know, we have the continent and the cities actually, they are in a way quite uh, disconnected physically. Oh, 
it's should I wait or okay <laughs> yeah <clears throat> yeah so it, it's a simple diagram showing in the year uh, 2010 we hit the 50 percent of our population is in uh, urban uh, which is kind of a dramatic uh, growth uh, in the in the past century uh, which uh, bring the situation of the the globe now is actually not anymore a a very disconnected archipelago because all the the population growth in the urban sort of realm and because of the technology development I think the globe has been pushed towards one kind of uh, becoming a, a, a big one uh, and this process I think uh, actually brings a metaphor of uh, of why there has been uh, so many uh, urban contradictions have been generated <coughs> Yeah, and on one hand, I think the human human race has seen an explosion in in urban living, and from all the world to become almost like a social kind of a urban society where you have this everyday scene of of people on the street with with all the traffic and and super crowded, and also with unexpected uh, unexpected uh, uh, growth of the built environment, uh, and that's kind of uh, in in a lot of location uh, that's a future as we imagined uh, the, the urban uh, will be, which the, the sort of in such situation, density, mobility, and becoming the, the new most popular topic in, in, a, in, a, in a positive way. Uh, yet, uh, from another angle, I think the, the, uh, in the, in the f uh, past decades, the global financial crisis has caused a massive uh, disruption of this uh, uh, kind of would be positive rampant urban growth. So while there is all this growth, but we know all this growth actually caused a lot of debt, and also with the with the collapse of this whole sort of uh, cycle of the money flow, we start to see a very kind of uh, 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 sort of uh, exaggerated conflict. For example, uh, suddenly there is this conflict between. Um, between the production and the consumerism, yeah, this is in uh, in uh, in Greece where the the farmers are all kind of protest uh, against this whole system, right? <clears throat> so between the development and the environmental uh, crisis, uh, uh, the environmental crisis can no longer be be denied, and the conflicts I think has replaced prospects. So what shall we do? How the urban condition can move forward? And I think this is also a metaphorical uh, image that's showing, I think, the, the future of the city has to be able to swallow all this uh, new, new development of technology. So being able to prepare for, for digest all this new urban conflict that has been generated in this process. Um, so I think the, the essential conflict uh, of, of the urban contradiction is this uh, exponential growth versus the the global crisis. So I think there's definitely some sort of uh, a, a deep uh, conflict in this. Uh, but just just try to try to uh, make this problem kind of in a, in a more uh, uh, a detailed way. So I name some other different topics in this basic two camp. So for example, rigid framework versus versus uh, mobile density. A mega city versus fine grain, a scale up versus scale down, hyper urban ver versus the urban. So I'll separate the topic to these uh, basic sort of dualities, and then we we talk about how this urban uh, kind of uh, uh, contradiction, like a you know, it's like an oxymoron that uh, tell us how to deal with in the future, deal with this uh, these dualities, these tensions, this kind of paradox. Um, so first, the, the distribution of urban population growth in different continents, I think, which entails that the urban is posing different tension at different parts at the globe. Um, and then the next one shows this is actually, uh, the urban proportion actually is a, it's a good cr criteria to show how well the nation, the national economy is developed, like China in uh, 19... 
90 is 30 to 70 uh, urban to rural percentage, while the, the number is expected to reverse to 70 to 30 uh, in half of the century. Um, also, by cities, you can you can see like city of like New York or Tokyo has a really really high sort of urban ratio. Uh, that also it's a kind of a, a signifier for for development. Uh, then we we look at from an urban morphological model how the growth of these mega cities uh, actually at another. Um, angle, there's also the fine grain, which is usually being neglected. Uh, for example, this is a, uh, a, a satellite map showing, actually, this is somewhere in the middle of, of Henan province in China, where these are, uh, each dot is a little village. And they're being evenly distributed in this, uh, in this kind of priory of the middle zone of Henan province. And then the reason they're so even is there's a very basic, simple rule that from each village, you walk to the next one, it's 30 minutes. Yeah, and then you see this very sort of basic, uh, a simple rule unfold to become this even pattern now start to concentrate, become some little town. And it start to even blur more uh, and, and, and sort of connect to, to a bigger and, and, and be interrupted by the infrastructure like the road and, and, and so on. And then, uh, as a comparison, this is uh, almost at the, no, this is not the exactly same scale, I'm sorry, but, but this is uh, in the Netherlands, where, where there's a totally different uh, kind of rules that why this very sort of strict pattern happens. Uh, and, and I think this is rela uh, related to the, to the agriculture, for example, tulip uh, racing uh, and, and, um, and private ownership. And this is uh, this is Belgium, and it's it's very close, but uh, yet it's another totally different uh, pattern. And then on the lower part, you see how a little village is kind of uh, developed along this very linear uh, uh, traffic line. And this is the world famous uh, national grid in the U.S. I think, uh, as I remember, is roughly 300 meter by 300 meter. So when when in a movie you see like we're on the grid you're on this kind of grid, yeah. So the, the one where we're talking is sort of basic, uh, looking at the, 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 the global surface from a really sort of fine grain uh, 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 kind of uh, resolution. And let's go back to the cities. And then at uh, a similar scale, for example, this one is uh, Amsterdam. And then we take a 300 meter by 300 meter, uh, yeah, 300 meter by, oh, sorry three kilometer by three kilometer square and compare the, the sort of scale of it. And, and like this is basically the old city of Amsterdam, roughly that size. And this is Barcelona at a, exactly the same scale. And so you can see the, the resolution uh, sort of change uh, varies from different city to different city. And this is Chicago uh, in the United States. Same three kilometer by three kilometer. And this is uh, Mexico City. Yeah, with this, uh, the mega blocks. But with the same scale, we only got like not only enough for one of the Palm Island in Dubai. And then the same. Uh, same scale, actually, basically the, the entire Tian uh, Shanzi area of Hong Kong uh, can be enclosed. And then for Beijing, yeah, the Forbidden City and the Qianmen area. Yeah. Okay, after the compar comparison uh, with the, with the non-urban area and the urban area, uh, let's zoom into uh, China. Uh, because I think that the Chinese situation is a very kind of uh, strange situation uh, in transition. So I think I will use the Chinese situation to explain a lot of the the current trend of of what I understand as the urban development and and, and contradiction. Uh, so this map shows basically with each dot. Uh, it's actually a satellite map of the night, showing the the kind of uh, amount of energy being used by by lights. 
So basically, we as we know, where there's more lights, uh, then there's a bigger city, right? Um, so these are the size of those. Uh, the bigger dots are major cities, and then the, the small dots are actually are these new cities. Uh, the new actually there's a whole, there's a, a bunch of 400 cities been been generating actually from a township being raised to the level of a city of population more than one million people. Um, that actually by the year uh, I think 2015 and that is expected uh, and the growth and we can see it's mostly concentrated. In, uh, in the middle zone. Um, so I think the first trend I, I would like to, to kind of uh, point out is new city started to sort of accommodate urban economic growth by sprawl. Yeah, and, and this, as we know, it's a, a very common practice uh, city that start to have a blurry boundary and then swallow the sort of natural growth of villages and towns and uh, eventually uh, and develop and occupy a large area. But in this process, there's all this sort of different patterns of urbanized versus not urbanized uh, uh, land. So these are, are, are all pieces that have been cut out from this whole uh, uh, kind of uh, holistic image. And this is uh, actually a photo of Shanghai. This endless uh, sprawl. You can see on the top right corner where is the the, the Shanghai Lu Jiazhu area. You see the little little needle is the the Pearl Tower. Yeah, but the city is endless by itself. Okay, so uh, then then uh, we talk about the urban morphological model. But then there's also I think other other level of uh, of of angle to to look at the urban. So this one, uh, I call it the, the hyper-urban versus the urban. In this one, I will show another two trend. First one is megacities intensify urban economic growth by implode. That means when the urban area is really being, being controlled and hold, for example, in the case of Hong Kong, is they cannot sprawl, so they start a kind of implode process. Um, Yes, we know this is the OMA proposal for a hyper building in Bangkok, which I think is another also a kind of architecture proposition trying to show, you know, what if we're not going out but putting uh, more the density of energy in one spot. Uh, actually, in the case of China, we have a very, because uh, uh, the first map is showing a kind of general growth, but if you actually look at why the, the pink is growing, actually the blue shows the migration. So you can see most of the mi migration still are concentrated in uh, Guangzhou and Shanghai, uh, the, the, Pearl, uh, the, the Pearl River del uh, Delta area and the Yangtze River Delta area and Beijing and Tianjin. Um, yeah, this is a, a project we did that are kind of trying to propose a, a future scenario for, for Beijing uh, with this kind of implode. I'll, I'll show a bit later. Uh, through uh, this kind of, uh, because all the migration is moving into the city, is, is occupying all the infrastructure and the framework and then utilize it in another, in a different way. So, you know, I, I call it urban hybridization. So this is actually uh, part of this uh, sort of implode energy. And in the end, we probably got something you know, like a urban mutation. Uh, the third trend is megacity contain de-urbanization, or we call it re-naturalization. Um, one of the kind of, I think this is also a trend in architecture itself also is, is we're trying <laughs> to make our architecture disappear. As we all know, the world want to be more physical. At the same time, there's a trend to be non-physical. Um, or architecture being covered by the nature. And um, uh, this is a, a photo, I think, of Athens. And then uh, 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 a kind of interesting scenario is how this city eventually disappear and become this. Uh, yeah. And and why this happened? I, I think this is uh, the photo, the latest photo Iwan Ban took for New York because I think the uh, at certain point the nature does come back. Uh, and, and then ask for their share 
and then we we start to imag imagine our city actually been uh, back to this sort of agriculture, uh, what we call a central agriculture district. Um, yeah, um, and so and then the next one is physical versus non-physical as another duality. Uh, I'll show a project that actually we did in 2010 in collaboration uh, during the, the, the Shanghai Expo in collaboration with the Rotterdam uh, kind of uh, uh, art platform called uh, V2. Uh, it's a, a, a dual city uh, workshop starting from the, the, the topic is called uh, Third Eye uh, as a kind of technology as the third eye to observing the virtual reality versus this uh, uh, this physical reality. So we start with the topic study about what are the sort of virtual side of a city. So this is, as we know, the, the game, the sims, actually trying to simulate uh, a, uh, a civilized life. Uh, and then this is a project called Second, uh, this is actually in Second Life, but this is a project did by Cao Fei in 2009 called RMB City, uh, which as you can see is kind of a improvisational collage of all this money-making project in China. Uh, and I think, the, but the, the simulation, the virtual reality has developed to a point where actually the, the, the photo on the left is a, uh, the, the, the uh, sort of the poster of Sim City 4, which on the right is a night image of the downtown Toronto. So there has been not, there has been a blurred boundary between the, the virtual games and, and the reality. And, and then I think this photo really, really shows sort of, uh, you know, I like it a lot, really shows our current situation. Uh, you know, the guy in the foreground, uh, uh, Sam Washington actually really weirdly looking at this avatar actually is also will be himself but now is still uh, not awakened yet uh, and but maybe that will become sort of the future and eventually actually in the movie the avatar itself become the, the, the future of himself. So the project actually uh, in, in collaboration with the elect, uh, uh, a kind of digital artist so he did this a little robot uh, with a video camera and with wheels that can rolling around and then it can uh, can observe kind of what it's, uh, it, it, it's, it, it sees and then transmitting the data online so you can log on in uh, Skype real time and control the robot to look around. Uh, and then so with this basic kind of technology and our concept, we started to develop this Twin City workshop based on the idea as Rotterdam and Shanghai, they're, they're all really sort of the biggest port city of the country. Uh, and there's some, we started some, do some comparison of the two city. This is uh, the, the image shows if the, 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 the sea level raises and so maybe Rotterdam where it will, will sink first and then soon later it's Shanghai. Uh, and then the, these are the two group of students, architects, uh, artists uh, between the two cities. Uh, we comprised uh, I think of around uh, 14 people, uh, 15 people uh, 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 each team and which we selected points uh, of the two cities that are of some sort of a uh, problem, or we say we can pose some problem in this point. Um, yeah, for example, there's problem in in Rotterdam that talk about, for example, the same topic: how how farm farming come back to the city. And in Shanghai, for example, there's a, a project talk about uh, parking lot, how to how to kind of solve that, and then how to solve a problem of. Actually, the, the other project called uh, Water Hydrum is talk about if the sea level raises Shanghai been uh, is sinking, then what, how can we how can we live this kind of uh, basic problem? And then we have a uh, session for city walk, which we start to observe all these different kind of uh, area of the city, uh, and then we do kind of memory diagram connecting different points. 
uh, video conference as we do we're doing now, but across this two city. But I find that very very inspiring. Uh, that the kind of talk between two city with different time zone, and with the limitation of technology actually generated a lot of problem. But these problem I think eventually will all become. It has to be solved in some way, and but then it, it will stimulate a different kind of way of, of designing. So, one thing to to compare is really funny. I, I did this afterwards to compare what uh, each uh, team of uh, uh, each team is come up with. Actually, each team are asked to study all these uh, these problem, this ten problem, and then come up. I think with each team with uh, around um, ten. Uh, Marcus uh, or design project with a physical model also to to pose uh, some answer for the for the question. So the the statistic data is first is uh, how many uh, uh, project has been around the topic of identity and the integration. So there's five project from Shanghai talk about this project. Uh, this topic and zero from Rotterdam talk about this, and then second is about green and sustainable architecture. There's seven projects from uh, from Rotterdam talk about this topic, two project from Shanghai engage this uh, topic, and then third one is about responsive or adaptive uh, adaptable architecture. Two project, three project, you know, from uh, each city, uh, kind of uh, is similar, uh, and then the next diagram shows the kind of scale of Proposal they bring up uh, in response to the to the project, and you can see the blue is from Rotterdam. Uh, actually, the it, uh, it it varies from kind of a bridge in front of your apartment uh, to a, a little farmland on top of your roof, uh, in in relatively kind of smaller scale and trying to engage with your community life. In in a but we're they're all asked to expect something in. I think it's by. 20 uh, in 15 years, so the the time span is the same, but the scale they come up with is dramatically different. And then the, for example, the Shanghai group come up with with uh, all this kind of uh, crazy floating island or or tower of uh, 10 kilometers kind of solution. So I think we have a different kind of uh, understanding of temporal spatial scale between these two cities. Which I think is really interesting when you're doing this kind of uh, by city or or multiple city workshop, uh, because the, the the conflict does pose a very important uh, issue. That do we really have a common kind of uh, common background for the understanding, for example, as density and scale? Are we talking about the same thing? Yeah. So these are the process of the two team. Kind of making this final exhibition, and so the the the, the all the markets they're doing are being uh, put in this temporally planned city, which is a city we call the uh, a kind of half Rotterdam, half Shanghai. Uh, you cannot really tell uh, because it really has been we we did this background as a basically collage this two city uh, into one. Uh, as the background, so you can take a look. Uh, yeah, we start with the Shanghai, and then you can, re if you can recognize, this is the the typical Shanghai scene, and then it move. Uh, yeah, uh, this is the Expo, and that's uh, that's Rotterdam. More trees, different scale, also. Yeah, this is the. Nutling Red Dyke building. Yeah, and the television tower. Yeah, the, the, the interesting thing is because of the uh, resolution of the video camera is not really high, so it does really blur the foreground and background together. And as you log on from Skype and then look at these things through, you, you can't really tell if it's real or not. It's just like a movie setting. And then also, as another function, there's a step pad. You can you can actually uh, uh, stand on the step pad to control the robot uh, looking around the city. So these are some photos of uh, the final exhibition. 
the interesting is this is the physical location, but there's people, uh, there's five robots, I think, uh, so people can log on from all over the world at the same time looking at all these. Yeah, for example, in the foreground, there's an island uh, designed by the Shanghai team. On the background is the Rotterdam, the, the tower on the near the, the Hotel New York. Yeah, so these are interesting kind of uh, juxtaposition, I think. The parking lot. Yeah. Okay, so next uh, issue will be about control versus versus enabling and rigid framework versus mobile density. And this is a project uh, we did a couple of years ago. Uh, it's called Wild Beijing. Uh, and, and basically trying to show that Beijing, because of the Olympic, that we have been coming to a point that, that the, the, from the top, we think the city will be resolved by a kind of holistic top-down plan. But in the reality, if you look at, if you zoom up in the urban surface, there's a lot of kind of self-organizing uh, kind of uh, growth happening uh, in between the spaces uh, that is sort of ignored uh, by the plan. And then how this thing actually works, how this thing actually grow and, and evolve, this is the, the, the things that we're interested in. Yeah, we call it uh, a city under construction. And so I'll go quickly. These are uh, the growth uh, map of Beijing actually uh, in, in, in the top plan it's been thinking as a ring city so the ring keep growing we have fifth ring we will have sixth ring and the, there actually there's even a proposed uh, seven ring seventh ring ring road of the city uh, but at the same time there's uh, by calculation there will be uh, sort of more than 10 million migration go into the urban area and how can you sustain such a migration? You cannot uh, keep kind of uh, sprawling because there's a, there's a point of a diminishing return. These people don't want to go even further. They need to locate close to the center to cut down their, their expenses. So we calculate after study, we locate all this area to between third and fifth ring road of Beijing. Actually, around 2008, there's a lot of this kind of like Da Hongmen garment uh, garment area and Shirihe, like construction material area, this kind of local economy concentration happened between the second, uh, the third and fifth ring road. But if you look at it now, it's already started to change, either disappear or become something more more solid. And this one, we look at the Dahomen area, actually, it's, it's the one in the middle, in the center on the, on the south of the center axis. Uh, this whole area that sort of is flooded by people from Zhejiang, Jiangsu, and all these provinces. They're all, all the, they're all good about making fabric, textile, clothes, shoes, all these. So these are all the little kind of, you can call it the mobile or, or illegal sort of street uh, uh, kiosk or stores. We, we come up to the street, we map all these out. And, but these things from a very temporary mode, they start to solidify themselves like, for example, in the first stage, they, they, they attach as a sort of parasitical to a building, or they have an open-air market, but they also move into some sort of a rundown interior space, and eventually they become a, a big shopping mall. Actually, in that area, they build the Bairong shopping mall, claimed to be the biggest uh, garment shopping mall uh, in, in, uh, in Asia. So. And then look at the, from the, the top-down planning. So these are all the residential towers and slab being sort of planned and, and, and proposed by the government. Uh, and, and they all look somehow like this kind of environment. And then this is a juxtaposition of the planned sort of framework and the improvisation uh, of this uh, street commerce. And then if we zoom in, these are, you know, if you study the relationship and the program of this thing, uh, this is what it looked like. And I'll show you a photo of a typical street uh, of that, what it looks. So this is a, a, a little hutong kind of street and full of these uh, garment stalls. Oh, it has uh, bookstores, also restaurants. Yeah, this is one of my favorites. Um, 
Yeah, and then uh, I come back this year. It's already been demolished by replaced by some residential towers. And so we studied the sort of like uh, treat them as a you know biology kind of facts, and then uh, study the evolution of them. And then we 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 find that, you know basically they're like in a metaphorical way they're like bacteria, how they infect a, a, a kind of a, 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 a kind of a, a live organism. Um, yeah, from a framework building being infected and eventually become this state of hybridization. And so uh, during a process of maybe 20 years, we, we first uh, some, uh, so analysis their growth and then we, we, we project their future growth in a more extreme way. Uh, and uh, with the somehow naive uh, kind of proposal of if they're not being killed, um, yeah from a status like that in 2004 and the second stage which is which if you come back now probably it's like this so maybe we think in the future it can grow up to this and even that and so what if the future plan of the city look like that so the gray part is the block and towers and then this and these are all based on the, 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 the sort of plan of all these stores. And then maybe eventually the section of the city become like this. Um, yeah. Later there's also a video shows in animation how this grow actually happened. Uh, back to this, uh, we call it Beijing Donut. Yeah. And the last one I'll show is the topic talk about utopia versus dystopia. So there's a histor history of sort of people dream about city in, in their imagination. And then there's this uh, cruel reality. Um, yeah, I'll go really quickly. The Tower of Babel, the Naked City. These are all proposals that how to bring city to, uh, to a kind of new level of, of imagination. Yeah, the captive globe by Ram. And this is the master city by Norman Foster, which is uh, really ideal to use the technology. So the entire city actually has been generated by the, is, is powered by the, the, the energy generated by the, all this kind of UV, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the photovoltaic. And we have a very clean city energy. Uh, and with the monorail, it's energy is all clean energy. But in, in reality, you know, actually they call the, 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 the Middle East area, the evil paradise. Yeah, that's what actually it looked like. And that's the new uh, John Novell building <laughs> with the crazy skyline. And this is a skyline of Tianjin. If you look at every single building, it's under construction. Yeah. All right. And then we did a project uh, looking at uh, actually based on similar kind of uh, observation between the utopia and the dystopia. If we look at the reality, there's a project called the Meta Hutongs. Uh, we're starting, we started to go to the, the Hutongs. And these are the leftover of Hutongs in Beijing within the Second Ring Road. Um, so the, the project is basically about, you know, well, a lot of people are talking about the historical value trying to go back to a really sort of uh, neotastic time of the hutong, what it used to like. And in the kind of cruel reality, those hutong are being uh, taken down in a, in a really fast pace or being, being remodeled, uh, become fake antique, like in the case of, of Jianmen uh, area. Uh, and then we propose actually we zoom into the reality and look at the different layer of information that is uh, is generated not only spatially, morphologically, but also like social relationship, uh, and 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 then uh, like maybe even demographically all these, and trying to bring all this invisible uh, information uh, uh, kind of in a in a, a more uh, obvious way. So the first stage will be by mapping, uh, and then we collect the information and we study the growth of it, and then we try to do a, a kind of simulation. Uh, of it, so and, and and maybe this will be kind of workshop uh, between uh, different schools. And I already talked with Chofei about this too. Maybe to collaborate uh, with their school to do a workshop about this too. And the final stage is to do a kind of interactive projection that tell that used on the, the sort of mechanism we learn from the reality and simulate in real time. But also in a way, if we 
manage, if we understand the rule, how they work, we can, we can be real time sort of uh, res uh, like responsible. Uh, so people can input something, you, have, you can see the real time feedback of it. Yeah. So there's a whole set of planned workshop and, uh, and production uh, and with a timeline. And so actually, the, as, a, as a sort of initial stage, we're now doing an exhibition in uh, San Litun, Beijing, uh, part of the Get It Louder exhibition. Um, it's called the Meta Evolution Project that is showing some of our previous research uh, that connects to, to the reality of the city. Uh, here is a few photo of the, of the exhibition. Uh, and then we did a model that, um, yeah, the model has also talked about this sort of this uh, duality where all the transparent uh, things are the framework and then the solid, uh, solidness are the, the sort of new growth. So in the end, I will show you a little video. Yeah, about this uh, meta evolution project. Oops, it doesn't show up there. Okay, but then, then I think. Ah, I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. Oops. This this version doesn't have music with it. <laughs> Stuff it's uh, it's previously been shown. Um. And this uh, the urban situation of Beijing for for quite a long time. Because we, we actually are here, we just want to make sure, you know, as a, as a local architect, a local, not only architect, but also kind of somebody interested in the urban situation, what you can, you can, you can learn from the kind of hyper situation. Yeah? Right, right. Well, maybe it's because I've been, been been going out, sort of detached, and then come back and we look at the situation. But I think there's slightly difference between what we do a project and the foreigner do a project. Yeah, because we're not, uh, you know, because we're so obsessed by this thing. I, I wrote in our Meta Futon project is, first, there's a current uh, kind of trend of being obsessed by the singularity of this space, the kind of uh, weird character of this space. Uh, but I think that's actually the utopian part. And then there's also... We are interested is not to be caught by one of these duality, but actually to find a space in between the, the utopian and dystopia and really look at what is happening in the reality. For example, this, this animation, it shows actually, after some site survey, we kind of uh, categorize all this, uh, what are the different things happening in the Hutong area in a period of time, like local economy, kind of um, social infrastructure, uh, even like rooftop addition and courtyard implosion. And then we actually uh, generated a set of uh, uh, abstract rules trying to simulate uh, how these things are actually growing. Um, because I think, you know, the, the reality has, it's so rich with many layers of information. And our, our, our rule is not to say, you know, as, just as a documentary kind of, we, we document the last uh, kind of uh, the final stage of or with, if we think it's a final stage of the evolution of some living organism. But rather, we're trying to study 
uh, you know, like the gene of uh, uh, of the of the creature, like how it evolved, what are the mechanisms actually at work, and then actually those might not be very uh, complicated rules. Maybe it can be a very simple self-adaptive kind of uh, a rules. It just self unfold. So what are these things we can find to kind of be more uh, effective in intervening in this kind of situation because if you I think in the future if you don't understand these things you cannot design with these things and you always design with the conventional top-down plan no matter how strong your will is you just simply don't understand so you need to start with with mapping simulation and with learning from these things then eventually you know with the with the help with the luck maybe you can you can understand some more Okay, so that's that will be the end of the lecture today. Yeah. All right, so we're done with our lecture here in Beijing. Um, I guess we'll um, see you guys in a few hours for the final review, I would say. So keep up the good work. We'll keep on updating you through the chat and everything in the meanwhile. OK, see you later. That uh, that can help actually, uh, uh, you know, not taking the the duality as something that is uncompatible, uh, but find a way to 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 make them compatible. Right, that's the sort of future. And then how to do it? You need some, you need to have a toolbox, right? And then and then I think for us the research is a way to build out build up every uh, our toolbox. Uh, you take an example like like I mentioned mm -hmm. this uh, kind of. Hutong renovation project that is happening all over the all over Beijing and in Tianmen. I think the architects and even the developer, even the government has a good will of doing it. But because they're not observing what are the different levels of information from the reality, they're still doing it. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say in a wrong way, but they kill all the things that are actually interesting. Uh, but the thing totally look like Hutong, you know, looks so much like Hutong, but it doesn't work. We all know it doesn't work. Then how to make it work? Well, I'm not critiquing him, no, no, him designing. No, I think the whole system, I think the whole system is based on, for me, it's based on a very kind of uh, one-sided attitudes towards the urban. You, we, we, I'm also not saying we just need to study the bottom up. We, need, we ignore the top down. And the reality is always in between the top down and bottom up. And both things have the right to, to, to be there and grow. But then we all know the rules of this top down planning. You know, we, we learn all this code, all, we learn all these numbers. But nobody has ever come up with any rules how to give some space to the to the to the bottom up growth. I'll take an example again. Like in the beginning, all the residential area, like the one uh, we survey, doesn't even have a bottom commercial area, commercial street. And then some of the tenant, uh, some of the the streets vendor actually find a way to to corrupt this system, so they occupy. Uh, the, the ground floor or second floor have their own little store there, like I showed photo there. But then later, if you see what all the all the residential uh, projects now, they all have this bottom two level of 
commercial strip, strip. Why? Because they already changed the way of the uh, uh, changed the urban planning rule, allow a little space for this thing to happen. Actually, for the developer, they're not that like you know you know uh, kind of grand elegant people. For them, it's just making this thing will make them have more profit. If you can change the rule so that you allow this thing to grow and to make the people that invest in it making more money, that will be a good kind of way, a self-unfolding, self-adaptable rule to do it. But what are these rules? First, what are the content that you're trying to stimulate? And then what rule you can stimulate this content? Who knows? I think the answer lies in kind of really seriously looking at uh, the, the content that has been ignored for so long. Uh, uh, and then we then we discuss it more and more with more public discussion, and then maybe that can can bring something interesting. The good thing about the Chinese situation is we have the energy. We because of the urban sort of suspension, because of the huge migration, we have all this energy to do it. You know, if the in the problem like if in Detroit you don't even talk about this, <laughs> there's no energy 